Hey everybody, welcome into another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and I'm so glad that you have jumped into this message today. I want to tell you, as we get started today, Merry Christmas. We're doing a full series of messages from the first week of December all the way through this year, and I couldn't be more glad about it. I love Christmas. I love Christmas messages, and I love looking at how Jesus fulfilled all of our hopes and dreams by giving us the best gift ever by coming at Christmas. I mean, that's what it's all about. And I hope throughout this series, you'll be able to share out these messages on video with family and friends to encourage them in the true Christmas spirit. It's all about coming to the manger. It's all about seeing Jesus. It's all about being in his presence and knowing him. And, and last week, we started uh, looking at the heart of hope. That's where this series began. Now, listen, all of the messages stand on their own. So if this is the first in the series that you've come by, stay with it. You're going to get something great out of the message today. But at the conclusion, if you want to see last week's message or any other in this series, go to our website. It's journeywesterville.org, journeywesterville.org. You'll find links there to our Rumble channel, our YouTube page, our Facebook page. All of those contain all of our teachings. We are a Bible teaching church in Central Ohio. Uh, last week, as we started again, the heart of hope, we looked at three things that were confusing for the prophets, but they're made clear by the coming of Jesus. And the reality is uh, we can't understand the hope of the Old Testament without seeing Jesus fulfill it. We looked at how uh, in the Old Testament, the prophets uh, were saying that Jesus is both going to be man and God with us, and he is. We looked at how in the Old Testament, they said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be called a Nazarene. He's going to be called up out of Egypt. He's going to do ministry in Galilee. How can he fulfill all of these things? Well, when then we looked at the story of Jesus and he fulfills all of those things. Jesus is everywhere he needs to be. And he is with us until the end of the age. He promises. When he came, he came with the promise to be in the right places the prophets had placed him. And his power uh, the third thing from last week, his power is to be the rock, a rock that you can build your life on, but a rock that can crush you if you deny him. And Christmas is the perfect time of year not to deny him. Uh, and that's where we started, with the hope of the Old Testament. Well, today, I, as I look at the heart of peace, we're going to continue on that foundation of the Old Testament. We're going to look at the promise of peace from Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 7. And we're going to look at the fulfillment of, of that Old Testament piece found in Colossians 1, 13 through 22. If you're taking notes, write those down. If you have a Bible, uh, key in on both of those. If you're just driving along and you want to listen, I'm going to be reading uh, the fullness of these two passages today as the basis of our study. A heart of peace. Now, now peace in our world today can be very confusing and hard to come by. I know if you look at the, the, the headlines of any newspaper or turn on any TV show, you hear about wars and, and fear and tragedy. The last thing you'll see or think of is peace. One of the stories that I've grown up hearing often at Christmas time was the World War I peace between the British and, and Germans. And it was uh, World War I was a trench warfare. There were trenches on either side with a no man's land in the middle. And it was brutal. It was a terrible war. If you've ever seen pictures or heard about World War I, you know how awful it was. I did a little research into the armistice, into the peace that, that, that is often talked about at Christmas during World War I. I want to read you a little bit of what I think kind of the true story, not the, the, the mythology is. And, and the truth of it is a little bit more sad. Late on Christmas Eve, 1914, men of the British Expeditionary Force heard German troops in the trenches opposite them singing Christmas carols and patriotic songs. They saw lanterns and small fir trees along the trenches across the way. Messages began to be shouted back and forth across the no man's land to, to the trenches. And the following day, which was Christmas Day, British and German soldiers met in no man's land in the middle. They exchanged gifts, they took photographs, and they played impromptu games of soccer. They also took time to bury casualties in their repaired trenches. The meetings in no man's land quickly 
dwindled out after Christmas Day. And the truce wasn't observed everywhere along the Western Front. Elsewhere, the fighting continued and casualties did occur on Christmas Day. Some officers were unhappy at the truce and they worried that it would undermine the fighting spirit of the men. After 1914, the high commands on both sides, on Germany and Great Britain, tried to prevent any truces on a similar scale happening again. Despite this, there have always been isolated incidents of soldiers holding brief truces in every war, and not only at Christmas. You know, our hearts long for peace. They, they long for a pause in the fights and, and the, the disruptions. They, they want just that moment. One of the great moments for me every Christmas, after we do our Christmas Eve service at our church, which I love every year, I, I come home, my wife and I uh, get the kids to bed, we uh, try to uh, wrap anything that needs to still be wrapped. There's always a couple things. We try to get everything now under the tree to really stuff it good with those additional Santa presents that we've hidden in, in an offsite secure location. We get everything full. We get everything ready. So our kids will have that wonderment, that, that excitement on Christmas morning. We get it all done. And usually about two o'clock in the morning, I will go out and sit on the bench outside in front of our house for a few moments. Now, I don't care if it's cold. I don't care how windy it is. I just... I'm excited that everything else is done and I can have a moment of silence and, and peace with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and just personally thank him for being the greatest gift to give his presence. And in his presence, we can have that wonderful joy for just a moment, just to let him take all of our cares and all of our worries and just have a moment of peace. It's only a moment. After that, the, the, the world continues to move and, and, and things continue to happen. You know, ever since... Adam fell to sin in the garden, and, and thistles came up. But work became difficult. His relationship with Eve wasn't as good anymore. Creation was broken. Disease and problems began to appear. The psychology, even of his children, one of his children killed the other. There was war and problems. And Cain was cursed to walk the land all of his days with a mark for what he had done to his brother. The first parents to, to feel right away the gloom and darkness of losing a son, the pain of sin. But in all of it, there's always been a promise. A, a promise of peace. A, a promise of hope. A promise to move forward. And, and I'm going to talk to you today about these two promises. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, giving a, a promise of peace and looking forward to Jesus coming. And then we're going to look at Colossians 1, 13 through 22, the fulfillment of the promise. Now, oh, we all look for peace. As I talked about uh, peace during a time of war and peace in my own life, uh, Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, looked for peace as well in the book of Ecclesiastes. He, he found that work didn't give him peace. It just made him tired and sometimes angry. That, that going to look for pleasure didn't give him any peace. It just brought pain. Stuff, all the things of the world, made him sick and sad. And even when Solomon looked to wisdom, he was frustrated and it led to ruin because he was looking at all the things under heaven. He was looking at things on this side of the sun, under the sun, without the Lord. Work, pleasure, stuff, wisdom, all of those things failed him. He needed only what the Lord could provide to bring him fullness and peace. Let me read to you from Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, the promise of peace to come. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time. And as they rejoice when dividing spoils 
For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of the battle and the bloody garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. What a great Christmas promise. Isn't it a great promise that this would be the gift, would be peace, and the nations would be on his shoulders? Because a child is born. Because a son is given. The darkness will turn to light. I, this started in verse 9 with talking about the region that Jesus is going to do his ministry. And the disciples talk about this, uh, that, that in this land of Galilee and Jordan, east of Jordan, this is where the, the major work of Jesus' ministry is going to happen because the light of the world has come. His teaching is wonderful and his ways, fantastic. The gloom and the distress will be exchanged for a light. It's kind of like that dark old neighborhood suddenly gets all spruced up with the lights of Christmas. Something great to see there in a place where nobody had any hope before. When Jesus shows up, there's hope. There's peace. There's something quieting, quieting and, and comforting. And I want to tell you, as, as we look at the peace, uh, you may say, but uh, like I was saying earlier, what about, uh, it's temporary. What about the world? What about all these other things crushing in? Well, the promise of peace isn't just temporary. The promise of peace leads to the fulfillment of peace in our lives. But listen, we have a choice in this. Uh, peace may be appealing to you, but you might choose to go and find that peace yourself. And like Solomon, you might want to invest in work or, uh, or achieving that peace personally. You may want to say, you know, I, I don't need you, Lord. I'm going to go find peace alone and I'm going to work it out. Or you may decide to ask the Lord for help in finding peace in your life. Uh, it's up to you. Th there are two ways to handle this. You can go and find this peace, or you can ask the Lord to help you with peace. In this passage uh, of uh, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, it ends saying, With justice and righteousness now on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. God will accomplish what we can't. God will accomplish the, the, the peace, the promise of peace that he wants to bring because we couldn't do it in and of ourselves. We can try for years and years, and I've seen people along Solomon's path that, that, that they know there's unrest, but they want to fix it themselves. And one of the things that happens in our world today is people will say, I'll find answers looking in. And nothing wrong with therapy or going to a counselor, but, but, but all of this inward looking, to look into their own lives, to look into uh, them finding answers for their own personal peace. That's their plan. Through work, through uh, pleasure, just enjoying life, through uh, stuff, getting new stuff, trading in their stuff, through earthly wisdom and earthly will. I'm going to tell you this, you can try that path, but that's not God's path. As I was reading through Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, this promise of peace, this is God's promise. He tells them the, the land where Jesus' ministry is going to be done. He says a, a child is going to be born, and he says this child will reign and this child will bring peace. And this is done because this is God's desire. That's the promise of godly peace. It's not a, a promise that we can go find it on our own. It's that we must find it in God. I, I want to bridge this across to Colossians 1, 13 through 21. And, and I want you just to look at verses 13 and 14 as we get started. There's a, a beautiful poem from 15 down to uh, verse 20. It, it's very similar in its structure, this passage to the poem you find in Isaiah 
uh, 9, verse 2 through verse 7. A little commentary at the beginning, a little poem about the promise. In, in 13 and 14, it says, He has rescued us, talking about Jesus, from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. Now, I, I love that, that, that both of these start off, both of these passages start off talking about gloom and darkness and a great light. And in both of them, the child is the light. Jesus is the light. And, and in Colossians 1, 13, it says that Jesus has rescued us. That's the he that this is talking about. From a domain of darkness and transferred us into a kingdom of the son he loves. When we come to Jesus, we leave the kingdoms of this world that are under the, the son. And now we're in a heavenly kingdom. We're in a different place altogether are you in a different place or are you still trying to figure it out down here in the world the domain of darkness for his king for his kingdom and then it says we have redemption the forgiveness of sins uh, that's the prince of peace he's doing what needs to be done what, what adam caused to alienate jesus is now taking care of to redeem this is god's plan and this was done by God's initiative to send his son. That's what we're celebrating. That God took initiative to cross a boundary, to do something, to come to us, because we weren't going to him. We, we weren't really getting righteous. Jesus talked to the Pharisees about it. They weren't really coming to God in their righteousness because they were faking their righteousness. It was a fake. It was a fraud. It was pride. It was arrogance. And God doesn't love those things either. They weren't better than someone else. They just weren't admitting what their problems were. They were not admitting their need. Matter of fact, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I came for those who need a doctor. Well, we all do at some point. It doesn't matter how healthy you think you are, how together you think you are. You may be watching this thinking, I have all the peace I'll ever need. There will be a day where you won't, where your health will be gone because it is given that every person once will die. You will someday face death. You will face the withering away of your fleshly body. Who will you call to for peace? Will you know the heart of peace? Or do you just look for peace under the sun? You won't find it here. Solomon didn't. And, 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 and the Old Testament prophet knew, Isaiah knew that we wouldn't. That the zeal of the Lord has to accomplish the true meaning of peace at Christmas. Let me continue reading along. It says in verses 15 through 20 of or 15, yeah, 15 through 20 here of Colossians 1. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by Him. In heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things are in heaven. You, you hear peace in here and you hear the kind of peace Jesus came to bring. And it's different from the kind of peace that we may start off demanding. Because we don't really know what's going to settle everything and quiet everything. In human wisdom, we want peace in all the other areas first. But this says, Jesus came first. Put him first. He's before all things, and by all him, all things hold together. We tend to look at all the negatives sometimes, don't we? Instead of crediting the Lord for what he's held together and what he's done. It's good at Christmas to write down a list of all the things we can be thankful for in the Lord. I, I love that Thanksgiving comes before Christmas. Thanking him before the fullness of his peace is given. We can thank him for the promise of peace and what he has yet to bring because his promise isn't like the promises of men. The Lord's promises are true. You can pray his promises knowing that he will fulfill them because those are the most powerful prayers. They're prayers of faith and hope. 
having a heart of peace means you fully rely on the promises of the Lord. The firstborn from the dead. Christians have hope even at the most bleak and dark times. A peace over death that the world can't understand. Verse 19 of Colossians 1, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of the cross. This is the kind of peace that Jesus came to bring. He came to make peace between us and the Father. You can search internally for all of your own kinds of peace. But if you're still not close to the great Lord of heaven, you still wonder about your shortcomings. You still, in the darkness of night, uh, wonder if you're good enough, wonder what your future will hold, wonder if you will be raised from the dead, wonder if there's anything more. One of the great things about the peace of Christmas is we don't have to wonder. Does God care for me? Will he come to me? Will he provide a way for me? Because that's the hope of the child Jesus coming. I'm going to look in our few moments remaining here at at Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22. If you have a Bible, just circle these two verses. And I don't think anyone's ever considered these uh, precious verses for Christmas peace. But I hope you will. I hope you'll look at them, and I hope you'll dwell on them. Because the fulfillment of our peace at Christmas is found in Colossians 1, 21 and 22. It says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Now, it goes by pretty fast, but I I just want to share with you three words before we finish this message today. And these three words, I'm going to pop them up on your screen right now, from verse 21 and 22. The first one you'll see right away, once you were alienated. You were alienated. Alienation means that you don't feel like you could ever come close to Christ. You've heard maybe about the baby in the manger, but you don't think you would have been one of the people to show up and praise his name. Maybe things have been too rocky in your life. There hasn't been enough peace. Maybe uh, you are, are tired of it, tired of all the hassle. So you don't want to go to anything religious. Why would you go to Jesus? Maybe you feel like my life is fine. My health is fine. My job is fine. My marriage is fine. I, I don't need to be close to him. Matter of fact, I don't know anything about the church or the way these Christians are. Maybe you've ridiculed the Christians and believers. Maybe you uh, live in alienation to Christ. Can I tell you that we all have started that way? Uh, can I t- tell you about the, the, the wise men from the East that would have been more alien than anyone else? But they showed up bearing gifts. Were they rejected? Were they turned away because they weren't the kinds of people? When the shepherds came down from the hills to the baby Jesus, were they sent away because they were dirty? The shepherds were looked at as dirty, and they weren't going to be tolerated in town. But were they alien to come to Christ? No. He received their worship. He received the worship of the wise men. Why? Because once we were all alien, and we were hostile in our minds because of our evil actions, because of our sins, Jesus doesn't save perfect people. He only saves sinners because that's all there are. I I want you to know as a pastor, I'm not pastoring because I'm a good guy. I'm a terrible guy. At 13, I went forward and gave my life to Christ. I confessed my sins to him and he has forgiven me. And every week when I fail at giving the sermon, I confess my sins and he tells me to go and preach again. I don't do what I do because I'm good. I do what I do because Jesus is good. And I was alien to him. Until at 13, I confessed my sins, and he forgave my sins, and he made me one of his people. And I didn't know what that meant, because my dad worked in a shop. When I was in uh, in seminary and in Bible college, a lot of the the other guys that were going into preaching uh, were, were sons of pastors who grew up in more religious homes than me. I always feel uncomfortable at pastor's meetings because these are good guys from good backgrounds and who am I? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I was alienated and I'm aware of it. My family wasn't on the same side of the tracks, but listen, we came to the Lord and we grew in the Lord because 
we were all once alienated. And I came to Jesus not because of my perfection, but because of his, because he can make peace. It's the first word I want you to think about. I want you to, to send this message to somebody who thinks they're an alien, could never be in the church. I've had people tell me, oh, I'd walk into your church, but it, but it would fall in. Listen, our church is brick. It's an old auto shop. It, it's not going to fall in. Those, those concrete blocks that make up our foundation are pretty solid. But more importantly, you need to know that we were all alien. And we all come together for one purpose and one purpose alone. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the child of peace to come. There were two kingdoms. And Jesus said, I'll let anyone in. I'll let anyone in. It's not for the religious or for the righteous or for the well-to-do. It's for anyone. We were all aliens. Jesus changed it. How did he change it? That's the second word. Second thing I want you to see. It says here, once you were alienated and hostile in your mind because of your evil actions, we all had before we came to Christ. No different. Any other person in the church, don't look down on anybody, Christian, because we're all saved by one thing, and that's Jesus. And you were just as bad an alien and a sinner as anybody else. Let them in. Let them in. Bring them to Jesus. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. Listen, you've been reconciled through him. It, if you want to come home this Christmas and you don't think you can come into church or come to the Lord or, or, or when I was talking earlier about that quiet moment, you don't think you can have a quiet moment where you confront him and pray with him and, and talk to him. You can because you're reconciled through him into the plan of God. You're reconciled through Jesus because he gave of his body for you at the cross. He was beaten for our transgressions. He was in sorrow on that cross for our iniquities. By his stripes on the cross, we're healed. That's what the scriptures tell us. Verse 20, by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether on things on earth or in heaven. Listen, what, what this passage says is all things are reconciled through the body of Christ. We're all reconciled because of what he did. He paid the price. Listen, if somebody tells you you have to pay a price to come to church, to come to Jesus, to come to the peace child, you don't have to pay a price. He did all the work for you. You don't have to give this Christmas to, for your guilty conscience because he paid the, the price for you. He gave the gift. Jesus came in the manger as that baby to be the gift for you. And you say, but that means I get in for free? Yes, it does. The only payment you have to do is humble yourself before him. The only thing you have to do is, is stop being prideful and arrogant and think you're better than somebody else because we all come in the same way. You are no better. We're reconciled. But were we all aliens? We're all aliens. Your, your excuse that you can't come close to Jesus is because you're not like a, a believer. You can be reconciled through his body. You don't need to be alienated anymore. You can be reconciled this Christmas because his physical body came and all things are reconciled through Christ. He is the promise of peace. And what does this mean? It means the, the third word here, transformed. And, and you say, Pastor Chris, what do you mean by transformed? I don't see transformed here. Read what it says next. By his death, we're reconciled to present you as holy, faultless, and blameless before the Father. How can we be holy, faultless, and blameless? I can't be holy. You may say, well, I'm alien to him. I don't know anything about the church. I don't know anything about Christians. How can I be holy? The same way anybody is holy. You confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're made right through him. You're reconciled through him, and you're transformed through him to be different than you were before. And listen, some people quake in their boots about this. How can I be changed? You can be changed by the presence of Christ in your life. He transforms you because he takes your sin away. Listen, I, there are a lot of Christians that are immature Christians. They struggle with death. How can you have peace with death, Pastor Chris? I can only have peace with death. It knowing that believers can be transformed to be more than victorious, to join Jesus in eternal life. How can I have comfort in war? How can I be peaceful when there's a war going on? Well, my peace comes from abiding 
in Christ, all things are reconciled through him, and I am transformed by the renewing of my mind as I study his word. How can you have confidence, Chris, in, in times of peril and dire emergency, when everything is flying apart and everything is going wrong, how can you have real peace? Well, I'm different. I've been transformed. Listen, it, it doesn't matter how far you are from the Lord. You can be his and come home because of God's plan. You don't need to be alienated. You can come to Christ. You don't have to live worrying if you have peace with God because you can have peace through Christ, through what he did at the cross for you, and you can be reconciled to the Father. No problems. And you can be changed in his presence. Listen, this Christmas, you get to decide. Do you want to try to fix yourself? Or do you want to say, Lord, I want to accept your plan. Help me. Help me to come to your son. Help me to be made whole through the gift that only Jesus can offer. And help me to be changed into a person of faith. Maybe you're mocking and, and scoffing. But you can be changed to a person of faith in the Lord forever and have forever peace in him. I want to read to you a part of a poem. It's from a, a book called Springs in the Valley from 1939. It's very old. And that's what is important. It's old, but biblical truths never change. The poem says, In the center of the whirlpool, while the waters rush around, there's a space of perfect stillness, though with turmoil it is bound. All is calm and all is quiet, scarcely even sense of sound. So with us, despite the conflict, when in Christ... His peace is found. When you find the peace of Christ in your life, in the center of your life that God has done, when, when you come and observe Jesus and you see him and you know he is with you and he, you know he has made a way for you to be reconciled to the Father so all your sins are forgiven and you can move forward in life without guilt, without shame and wholeness of Christ. Reconciled through him, reconciled to him, transformed into something you never thought you could be. You begin to walk and live in a different way, and you fulfill the promises of Christ in your life that you live in peace, even with death, even with peril, even with wars, even with terrible things going on around you. Why? Because you found a heart of peace, the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ that says, don't be troubled in storms, and he delivers his disciples through them. He tells them, don't be troubled in death, and he delivers Lazarus from the grave. He tells them, don't be troubled in sickness and in, and in hunger and in famine. Don't be troubled because I can provide the food and I can provide the path forward. It doesn't mean you will never meet those things, but when you meet them, you're transformed by the presence of the Prince of Peace to go through them in a new way with the hope of Christ and the peace of Christ on you. So this Christmas... As we move closer to the peace of Christ, get to the center of it. Maybe around all the edges are the rings of all the turmoil of the whirlpool, but in the center is the calmness and the, the coolness of Christ because he is what be, has been given by the Lord and can't be taken from you. And once you experience his presence, you can be transformed by it. Don't miss the transforming nature of the presence of Christ in your life this Christmas. Take that moment. Take that break. Come to him. Don't be alienated. Let him reconcile things in your heart and set you right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this time. And I thank you for these two wonderful passages of Scripture. Lord, I pray for each person that watches this. In all the moments of their lives, there are, there are moments of turmoil. There are moments we're upset. But help us to go back to the peace of Christ and understand the great gift that you gave us in the presence of your Son the great hope of Christmas, the great desire of Christmas peace. And I know for our church on Christmas Eve, we'll have that moment with the, the, the candles lit, with singing Silent Night. We're all, take a moment, take a beat. And we'll look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, given for us, that we might be reconciled and transformed forever. 
Father, I pray this year you will raise up your son in a greater way than ever before to show this world what true peace with you means. That there is no longer a break between us and the great God of heaven. But through what our Savior did by coming into this world, peace has been brought. Peace has been given. And to that peace, one day we will all be delivered for eternity. Help us, Father, this year to hold on to the peace of Christ and know that ultimately all other kingdoms and wars will be defeated by him because everything will be reconciled to your kingdom forever through our Lord and Savior Jesus. In his name we pray all things forever. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, my friends, I don't know what more I can do for you to give you a joyous Christmas than to send you to the heart of peace in Christ. When you find him, you've found everything you ever need. Without him, nothing will ever satisfy. I hope you'll hold Christ in your arms this Christmas. But more importantly, I hope you'll let him hold you. You may not aware of, be aware of this, but the Lord loves you more than you will ever know. And he desperately wants you to come home. He desperately wants you to come home to the Savior this year. Well, my friends, I'll be back next week with another Christmas message. I hope if you're in the area, you can come out to, to Journey. I would love to meet you and encourage you in Christ. And I hope to see you soon.